Uh, hello to everyone. I am Rabia Bilgücü, uh, an assistant student at the Smart Cities and Digital Ecosystems Lab. Uh, I sincerely welcome you to the seminar, which will be given by Professor uh, Giancarlo Guizardi. Uh, this is the fifth of the seminar series organized by uh, Top Ed to the Smart Cities and Digital Ecosystems Lab. Uh, the talk will take around 45 minutes, uh, approximately in every two weeks. Uh, we will have distinguished speakers all around the world. Uh, to introduce our speaker today, uh, I first give the word to the Professor Dr. Mehmet Akshit, who is the uh, head of our lab. Thank you. Thank you, Rabia. Uh, so it's my honor to uh, introduce Professor Giancarlo Guiziardi. Uh, uh, I am sure it will be a very interesting talk. Uh, especially for myself, if I may be, if I may say that, because uh, modeling is at the heart of my, uh, I don't know where, but uh, in my heart, let's say. And uh, I, I think it's a very, very important topic uh, for uh, many disciplines, but especially for software. Let me introduce Professor Guziardi briefly. Uh, uh, because he has a very long CV. Of course, he has done uh, a lot of uh, work in modeling. Uh, he's one of the experts, uh, top experts in the world. Uh, Professor Guziardi has been working in the fields of ontology, conceptual modeling, and enterprise semantics for many years, more than 20, 25 years, maybe 30 years. He is currently a full professor of computer science at the Free University of Bolzano, Bozen, so, uh, South uh, Tyrol, Italy. But uh, uh, we are also very proud that he is uh, also a professor at the University of Twente uh, in, in the Netherlands. Uh, he is a senior member and co-founder on the Ontology and Conceptual Modeling Research Group in Brazil. Over the years, he has worked in uh, technology transfer initiatives in the areas in sectors such as software engineering, energy, finance, complex media management, healthcare, digital journalism, government, tourism, cybersecurity, mobile payment, among others. He has, of course, very uh, many publications and uh, a lot of contributions in this uh, area. And we know each other for a long time, uh, probably about 25, 30 years. Uh, uh, so uh, from that perspective, I am very, very happy that he has accepted our invitation. And so uh, I invite now Professor Guziardi to give his speech. Thank you once again being with us in this seminar. Thank you very much, Professor Akshit, for the, the invitation. Uh, it's a really, an, the honor is all mine. Uh, I, for those of you that don't know the story, I. I'm coming back to 20. I did my PhD there more than two decades ago. And uh, Professor Akshit was already a giant back then. So he was one of my idols. So I went there on his, to knock on his door. In the first week I was in 20 and uh, he was very kind and you know, listened to this uh, crazy PhD students talking about ontologies 20 something years ago. And uh, it was great. And I, it's, it's an honor to be able to continue the conversation now. So the, I'll try to behave and stay within the 45 minutes. Uh, let me know if I you know, get too excited and go um, you know, uh, beyond the time. So this is about ontologies in, a, in many senses of the term. And it's also about patterns, which I think are two cornerstones of the research I've been doing uh, you know, since we had that talk many years ago. Let me start with, with this cartoon, which I find uh, really brilliant, and it really captures the gist of what I want to talk about here. So this is a story of this uh, pig that comes to, to the other pig and says, have you noticed that the farmer has been using the words ham, bacon, and sausages a lot lately? And the other pig says, yeah, what do you think they mean? Mean is the key word. I'm going to find out. And then first pig goes to the library and come back, comes back later and says, Maurice, I've got some very bad news. I think this really, really captures, we all understand the joke, right? This is by the cartoonist uh, Tom Gold, which is one of my favorite cartoonists. Uh, he writes for The Guardian, New Scientist, and so on. I think he really captures the notion of meaning I would like to um, talk to you um, about today. So 
meaning in the sense that makes us understand the joke and also that makes it funny and also uh, helps, perhaps helps Maurice here, is a meaning that is not this one, right? So for those of you that had context with uh, logics and ontologies in a very logic driven sense, so description logics, um, that's, that's uh, you will recognize a picture like this, right? Where meaning is kind of the mapping of symbols to some sort of mathematical structure or model theoretic structures. So in other words, a mapping from a piece of mathematics to another piece of mathematics. Understanding this, what we see here, won't help Maurice at all, right? What would help Maurice is a, a different sense, an older and a more basic sense of meaning, which the mapping from symbols to concepts that we all share. So what is the relation between ham, sausage, and, and bacon, and pork, and pigs, right? So this kind of dependence chain is what would help Maurice to understand why they are in trouble uh, because the farmer is using these words very often lately. So meaning in this sense is the original sense of the, the term semantics as well. So semantics is a function from symbols to shared concepts. So concepts in a shared conceptualization. And this is the sense of the term semantic domain modeling that I'm giving emphasis to uh, in this talk, talk today. So it's not semantics in the sense of having some formal semantics, although that's very useful, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. But that's secondary in the sense that formal semantics can only help you if you get this, the, the, what is called real world semantics right. So semantics in the sense that I'm, I'm focusing on uh, today is actually can be seen as an interface between reality and cognition. It's the way the human cognition builds these conceptual models of reality. So a mediator between the way we see the world, the way uh, humans build these conceptual structures about the world, and the characteristics of the world itself, which resist us doing uh, completely arbitrary things, right? So it's the, the, the actual relation that exists in the world between bacon, sausage, and ham, and, and pigs, and um, our use of these concepts and ultimately of terms to refer to these concepts. This notion of semantics is very old in computer science, very old, what is called real world semantics. And it's inevitable dealing with that. So for example, the most, any, any type of information structure has, that is not just a pure uh, mathematical structure, that's not just pure mathematics, has semantics in this sense, right? So even the most mundane database, so we have a database here about, you know, economic agreements and between customers and suppliers, this database kind of commits to the existence of these things, right? Of people who can believe in living people or deceased people, customers which can be personal or corporate customers, organizations which can be active or not, organizations that are suppliers in the economic agreements and economic agreements. So it's like, you know, this database has some sort of theory about what kind of things it allows to exist, it admits uh, to exist in a given world. So it embeds a certain worldview. This uh, notion is very uh, old, again, in computer science. This was put forth for example, by this uh, guy called George Mealy. George Mealy is the creator of Mealy Automata in computer science, a very known formalism in computer science. Mealy is also the PhD supervisor of a guy called Peter Chain, who invented the ER diagrams, entity relationship diagrams, and who founded the, the, conceptual, the international conceptual modeling community. Mealy had this idea that data are fragments of a theory of the real world. And that data processing is about juggling these representations of, of these theories, fragments of these theories, right? And that, more importantly, that this is an issue of ontology or the question of what exists. What, what Milly was defending in this paper in 1967, hence the first mention of the term ontology in computer science, was that doing a when you create a database, for example, or when you create a software uh, application, or when you create any type of information structure, even when you create a subway map, if you like, what you're doing is that you are 
trying to specify and trying to control a given ontological commitment, the commitment to a given theory of the real world, a given world's view. So this is the first sense of uh, the word, the term ontology that will appear here, a sense which Milly was referring to. So ontology in this sense with a lowercase o, a ontology, is a particular theory about the kinds of entities and their ties that, that are assumed to exist by a given description of reality. In the past, let's say 30 years, people decided to call ontology just the given description of reality, right? Not the theory, but a given description of the a theory using a particular computational language or particular formal language. So typically computational language in computer science. So ontology in the latter sense of an artifact uh, uh, together with you know, knowledge schemas, conceptual models, knowledge graphs, these are all contained in what I'm calling a uh, semantic domain model here. So these are all types of uh, information structures and they all should have explicit and well-constructed real world semantics. In other words, when you create these structures, we are making ontological commitments anyway, and we better do that uh, properly, right? So this is the first takeaway message of this talk, that the opposite of ontology is not non-ontology, it's just bad ontology. When you create a database, you are doing ontology work without knowing, because you are saying, you know, there are transactions, there are customers, there are suppliers, and so on. This is a kind of ontology work. You're forming a theory of of the real world. Even when you are doing programming, you know, Donald Knuth has this great sentence. He says, uh, programming is about telling the other human what you want the computer to do. It's not really about telling the computer what you want the computer to do at all, because the choice of data structures and variables uh, as well are, are kind of reflecting these semantic uh, choices. Well, things get much more interesting because uh, these databases, which make this, all these different ontological commitments, they don't exist in isolation, right? So all interesting problems that we need to solve in science, in governments, in, in organizations these days can only be solved by putting together data silos which have been developed in a concurrent autonomous ways, right? So data silos that have been developed by different people in different point in time, but all questions we, we need to answer can only be answered if we put together the things, right? And putting together the things, I, I, I hope it's clear by now, is relating these different theories of the real world, is looking at what kind of theory of the real world is embedded in the database on the left and on, in the database on the right, and finding out how they, they relate. Right? So this is called the problem of semantic interoperability. So interoperating things in a level that their meaning, the meaning of the things represented there in a line. In other words, it's about how to relate these different worldviews, these different conceptualizations of reality ultimately. So, and which boils down to this, right? So if I have the notion of person in the system on the left and the notion of person in the system on the right, I want to find out what is the relation between the two. And the only way to find out this relation is to find out the relation between their reference in reality. What are the things in the world which are represented by this species of data? And, uh, and then I find out what is the relation that I could code in the data. Right? So if I know, for example, that the relation between person on the left and person on the right is a relation of identity, then I can write the formal constraints for identity, right? That this is a kind of equivalence relation, reflexive, symmetric, transitive. Identity also uh, has this property if the, that if two things are identical, they necessarily have the same properties. It's called the Leibniz law. So I better know that this is a, a relation of identity because it's a very strong relation. This one, for example, I have economic agreement on the left and economic agreement on the right. So what is the relation between the two things? If not one of identity, then what? What are the other possibilities? Specialization, composition, what kind of composition, dependence, what kind of dependence? Historical dependence, existential dependence, a generic dependence, and so on. Yeah, if the, one of these is an event, maybe there are two events, we can have a relation of causality and so on. And what are the properties of the, a relation of causality? So, so in order to answer these questions, calculating the relation between these notions in different models, 
we need ontology now in the oldest sense of the term, which is referred by Mealy as well in that paper. So ontology here with a capital O. Ontology with a capital O is an area devoted to developing this domain independent toolboxes. So it's a so these are toolboxes with a number of conceptual tools for finding out these relations and understanding the nature of these relations, right? So this, these things which cross cut several domains, hence the domain independence, domain independent toolbox with tools for supporting all these different kinds of ontological methods. So ontology with the capital O is basically a set of theories and a method for ontological analysis. Since we are doing system engineering here and uh, we want to solve interoperability problems in computer science, we want to take this knowledge from ontology with a capital O and build an engineering discipline that can help us to, um, to build ontologies in the lowercase o, right? Or representations of the onto of ontology in the lowercase o. So we need uh, this thing called uh, ontology-driven uh, conceptual modeling, which is an engineering discipline that help us to bridge these theories coming from philosophy, from linguistics, from logics, from cognitive science, in the design of tools, engineering tools for building these models, right? And tools by tools, I mean theoretical tools, methodological tools, computational tools for model building, model verification, validation, modularization, model evolution, and so on. So what I'll do with my with the second part of my talk, a bit, bit more than that, is to actually give you a roadmap of these tools that we have of one ontology, one toolbox in the sense that I just mentioned, an ontology with a capital O, and uh, a, a number of tools, a whole tool ecosystem based on that ontology that we have been developing for more than 20 years and which has been applied to a number of problems in different disciplines. So the toolbox in this case is something called the UFO, the Unified Foundation Ontology. And this is a, a, a system of micro theories, uh, axiomatic micro theories dealing with all these different notions that appear in conceptual modeling, knowledge representation, so in semantic domain modeling in the sense that I, I refer to here. So it's dealing, for example, with object types and identity and taxonomic structures involving object types, uh, partial relations, different types of relations and relational properties, events, data types, att attributes, multi-level modeling, so this notion that a type can be an instance of a higher order type in multiple levels and so on, right? From this, um, from this theory, from this system of micro theories, what we did was to develop a number of these tools. And one of the, one central tool there is a language called OntoUML. So OntoUML is a version of UML um, that commits to this underlying foundation ontology in two senses. One is, the modeling primitives of the language reflect the ontological distinctions put forth by this ontology. And from the axiomatization of the ontology, we derive a number of formal constraints which are embedded in the grammar of that language, the meta model, if you like, of that language, mm -hmm. such that the only valid models, grammatically valid models that you can build in ontoML are models that conform to the underlying axiomatization, to the underlying ontology. So it's an ontology, it's a language that commits to this foundation ontology in a strong sense. So let me give you a very, so ontoML looks like UML, although with, uh, with a different uh, syntax, abstract syntax, uh, some extensions in the concrete syntax in terms of stereotype, and also with, uh, with a formal semantics defined by this mapping. But it's, it looks like UML. But instead of just stopping, for example, at the level of this general level of types or class in UML, just having this general notion of class, we have finer grained distinctions among types of classes, right? So we make, for example, a distinction between what's called a kind. A kind is a type, a class, which classify their instances in a, in a necessary, in an essential way. So these kinds define what, are, what the things in this domain essential, essentially are. So describe the properties that these entities have in all possible situation and provides a kind of principle of identity for the instance that exists in this domain. So let's suppose that in this toy example, we have two kinds of things, people 
and organization. I'm, for example, an instance of a, the kind person, and the universe of Twente is an instance of the kind organization. Although I'm necessarily a person, so I'm a person in every situation that exists, I'm contingently a living person. So there will be a situation in which I'm not a living person anymore. Um, the universe of Twente is necessarily an organization, but it's only contingently an active organization. So it can pass to be an extinct organization. Hope uh, it never happens, but it, it, might, it might be the case. So there are a possible world in which the universe of Twente went extinct for some reason, right? So these are contingent or dynamic types or categories, right? But they all related to um, intrinsic changes. So being a living person is a, it's a dynamic uh, type that classify instance of the kind person, but you move in and out of the extension of that type by some change in an intrinsic pro property, some, something intrinsically changing me, and I cease to be a living person and become a deceased person. Now, there are types which are dynamic, but which are also relational, and these are called roles. So, so for example, if I'm a father, no father is necessarily a father, so you become a father in a certain situation, and you could have existed without becoming a father, but you do that by establishing a relation to something else. Same thing for being a husband, or being a wife, or being a client, or being a um, supervisor, or being a citizen, and so on, right? Um, now, we also have types here which classify things of multiple kinds like customer here, classify things of the kind person and of the kind organization, right? So these are called mixing. So type which classify things of multiple kinds. If I could offer a geometric metaphor, let's look at, 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 at this thing in this way. Imagine that your universe is tessellated by kinds, right? So it's completely fragmented, partitioned in kinds, such that everything belongs to one kind, one unique kind and cannot move out of that region of the kind. Things like phases, what is called a phase, like a living person or a teenager, and a role, uh, they are shadows moving within the, state of, uh, the space of a kind without ever crossing the bo uh, boundaries of these kinds, classifying and declassifying things. And then we have mixings. Mixings are these things which cross the boundaries of multiple kinds. And they can be static, like being a physical object. Every physical object is necessarily a physical object, but there is no single essence for all physical objects, if you like. So there are watches and bridges and computers and people who are all physical objects. And then we have dynamic mixing. So these shadows that move across kinds, classifying, declassifying things, like the customer that I said. No, no people, no person and no organization is necessarily a customer. So this is a tiny example. So suppose we have this general notion of type. Now I'm creating a small typology or a small ontology of type here. We have either mixing, so things which cross the boundaries of kinds, or what's called a sortal. So a sortal is, is either a kind or a specialization of a kind, right? We have kinds, roles, phase, and mixings. This applies, so the word endurant here means object in a broader sense. So not just objects like you and me and the universe of Twente, but objects that can also, that are existentially dependent on other objects, like my headache, for example, that can only exist if I exist, or the marriage between John and Mary, which can only exist if John and Mary exist, or the economic agreement between the customer and the supplier, which is existentially dependent on the customer and supplier. This thing can have their own phases, can play their roles, can have their own life cycles. These are not association classes in UML. These are objects of their own, uh, but they are existentially dependent. They can only exist by binding other things. There is a strong relation between things like the economic agreement and relations, right? So the relation of contracts with between a customer and a client is derived from the existence of an economic agreement. So. Joe buys from Amazon because there is an economic agreement, a contract between Joe and Amazon. This is very important because although most uh, conceptual modeling languages and knowledge representation languages just use that relation on top, right? The contracts with relation, that relation is very ambiguous with respect to a number of aspects, but I'll, I'll focus now on the inherent ambiguity of the cardinality constraints there. 
So here I'm saying, you know, a customer can contract with one too many suppliers and a supplier can contract with one too many customer. What does that mean? Here's one possible interpretation that, you know, given an economic agreement, I have just one customer, but I can have several suppliers in the same economic agreement. Here's another interpretation in which given an economic agreement, I can have several customers that join together in one contract to buy a product, but only one supplier, right? So, and I can keep varying all these different things to have just, you know, what several customers, several suppliers, but they can only participate, each of them can only participate in one agreement. I can create all these different interpretations as you probably notice now the cardinalities of the original relations never change, meaning those cardinalities, uh, they collapse a number of possible interpretations, right? And so they are unable to differentiate these things. And, and this creates a number of problems for interoperability because the actual intention, the actual real world semantics of that relation simply not there. This is even worse because I would like to say, for example, uh, to establish a relation between the pair, Joe and Amazon, and the number of uh, economic agreements in which they can participate. So how many times can Joe buy from Amazon, for example? Here in this model, this is telling me that Joe can buy things from Amazon in several economic agreements, maybe in, even in parallel. Um, this is simply not there. So as you can see here, all the, we have 12 variables in all these different cardinality constraints on these uh, relations here, which are collapsed to four variables. So we can analytically show that you have ambiguity by design. Right? So what? So these are examples of ontological distinctions embedded in this language. And the question that pops up is, what does that buy us? I mean, what, what do we get from, from making these distinctions of, of being so precise in these distinctions? And I'm gonna show you seven seven examples of things that uh, are benefits from, um, from this approach, from, from making the semantics, uh, having semantic clarity and ontological precision in the modeling language. So here's the first one. Well, you, if you take one entity, this entity um, se instantiates several different types, sometimes at the same time, sometimes at different points in time. So Mick Jagger here, the senior citizen, in instance of this type, senior citizen, is identical to the guy on the left, Mike Phillip, Mick Jagger, when he was a boy in Kent. The one on the left is a boy, the one on the right is a senior citizen, but they are somehow identical, right? Um, the one on the left does not instantiate senior citizen, and neither the one on the right instantiates boy, but they are somehow identical. So there are changes that the guy on the left undergoes radical changes in size and weight, height and weight and, you know, facial complexion and bank account and so on, that in order to turn into this guy on the right, but these changes won't alter the identity of, of these guys, right? You know, he's also a singer. He is also an actor. We can even do some sort of counterfactual reasoning and imagine a world in which he never dropped out from the London School of Economics and that he is now an economist. So all these guys that, that have incompatible properties are identical. And each of them instantiate a different type, right? Economist and singer and boy and senior citizen. How is that possible? It's because there is one single type, one single kind that they all necessarily instantiate and that provides its principle of identity, namely person in this case. So although all these things uh, apply to Mick Jagger in different points in time, they are not just logical predicates. They apply to Mick Jagger with different forces in different ways and with different consequences. Moreover, all these notions of roles and mixings and phases and so on existed in the, in the literature of conceptual modeling, object-oriented modeling knowledge representation for decades, but they were defined in a very informal way. Here we have a very precise set of meta properties, so this thing of identity and uh, dynamic or not, relational or not, that I was telling you about, that we can use as a, me a methodological guideline for asking questions about the things and then for guiding our decision on how the things should be modeled given our conceptualization. So given the conceptualization that I'm assuming here, I can defend that the type person is a kind, 
that the type role, uh, sorry, the type singer or economist or British citizen or knight of the British Empire, these are all roles because they are dynamic. They classify things of one kind, person, and because they are relational, um, that, you know, living person is a phase, and that being a cultural heritage item, which both Mick Jagger and the Taj Mahal instantiate, is a mixing. Here's the second thing. So we get semantic clarity and we are explicit on what are the choices we make with respect to these meta properties uh, given our conceptualization. The second uh, thing that this, uh, this whole thing buys us is being able to calculate with concepts to solve that problem that we saw before. So now because this language is marking in its syntax and semantics, these ontological distinctions, I know that person on the, on the left and person on the right cannot be identical because the one on the left is a kind and the one on the right is a face. So actually person on the left is identical to human being on the right, which is the super type of that uh, of person. And here, um, economic agreement on the left is, a, is one of those existentially dependent bundles of commitments and claims, and it cannot be identical to economic agree agreement on the right, because economic agreement on the right is, is an event. So it's the manifestation of those commitments and claims. This, is, this seems like a trivial problem, maybe, but this is very hard. I mean, even a, 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 a uh, you know, superficially trivial concept like person can hide, hide very, very uh, complex and subtle distinctions in meaning, right? So I can have at least four different interpretations of person. Person as a human being, which would be a kind, which we all are. Person as, for example, the notion of a legally recognized human being, so a human being that is recognized as, as such by a state or a jurisdiction. The notion of cognitively capable human being. So this is a legal notion of human being. For example, if I'm brain dead, I'm not a person in the, in the third sense anymore. And person in the sense that would include anything which can participate in legal contracts, which will, would also include organization. So we can recognize that these four different models here with one concept are talking about different things and we can find out how they can be related, for example, in one single model. Right, so for example, this model. I can also make a small change here in which cognitively capable human being is someone who's cognitively capable and recognized as such by a legal state, which means that cognitively capable human being is not a phase anymore, but a role now. Uh, so something which specializes both living person and legally recognized person. So we can capture all these different distinctions and subtleties in all these different models. Third point, that all these different primitives actually embed a given micro theory. So understanding what a role or the notion of role in ONTML is understanding the micro theory of roles in UFO. So for example, we have that roles are such that all instances of a role are of a given kind, of one unique kind, like for example, all students are people, that instances of roles instantiate those types uh, contingently, so no student is necessarily a student, you all will see to be a student uh, eventually, that uh, instance of a kind instantiate a role in a relational condition, so in order for you to be a student, you have to be enrolled somewhere, uh, in an education institution. And also there are some more sophisticated constraints like a role cannot be a super type of a kind, otherwise you run into a logical contradiction. So once we have, we take this axioms of this micro theory and we embed in the language um, this as synthetical constraints, semantic motivated synthetical constraints. So the models won't compile. So if you have a model like this with a free floating role without telling the identity of the things playing those roles, this would be a grammatically incorrect model. If you take student and put it as a super type of, of person, um, this will be an incorrect model, uh, an inconsistent model, logically inconsistent model. And we cannot have that students are not, uh, are enrolled in zero to many education institution because being enrolled in an education institution is part of the very definition. It's the relational condition uh, for something, someone to be a student. But we can actually do better. So instead of thinking about the things we cannot do, right? We could realize that there are a few things we can actually do. So the difference between an ontologically neutral language like first order logics or UML or ER diagrams or OWL and so on, and a, 
an ontologically less neutral language, so a, a language that really commits to a, a foundation ontology, is that the latter, in the latter, the modeling primitives of the language won't be low-level primitives like you know, class and relationship and attributes, but it will be patterns. Because in order to use a construct, you're going to have to use a set of other constructs forming a cluster. So this language really becomes a pattern language. And creating models in ONTOML is instantiating a number of design patterns. So for example, it emerged from the definition of a role that whenever you have a role, it will eventually specialize one unique kind. And the roles that have to be defined in this relation such that the minimum cardinality constraint of the opposite association end of that relation has to be at least one. So the models, in the models, you are gonna recognize this pattern here, right? As well, another instance of the same pattern. Same thing for phases. So if you have a phase, it's a phase of something of a kind because you can always move out of that phase. You have to move in into another phase of the same kind. Phases are always defined in what is called a phase partition. So disjoint, disjoint complete uh, generalization sets that eventually specialize one unique kind. Um, this is a, what is called a row mixing pattern. So something that really looks like a role, but which crosses the boundaries of multiple kinds like customer, for example, customers can be people and organizations. And also we have the pattern of relations having the explicitly, the explicit modeling of what is the semantic core of that relation, the so-called truth maker of that relation. In the case of contracts with will be the economic agreement and the specification of all these cardinality constraints that um, disambiguate that relation. Once we have a language that is a, a pattern language, we can actually build a tool for instantiating these models by instantiating patterns. So for example, here, here we have person and we say deceased person is a phase uh, of, of person and that living person, so because it's a phase of person, there should be at least another phase, right? In this phase partition. Same thing for uh, organization. So we say an organization is something uh, of a kind and uh, active organization is a phase of organization. Again, because this is a phase, there should be at least uh, another phase of the same kind. In this case, uh, extinct organization. And now for the more sophisticated pattern is this role mixing pattern. So we say customers, uh, so personal customer is a specialization of living people, which is already there in the model. Uh, corporate customer is a specialization of active organizations. The role mixing in this case is customer. The relational condition is this uh, service contract, let's say, the economic agreement in this case. And the thing in the other end of the association is a role play by active organizations called a supplier. And then we instantiate this entire pattern. So we have this model, which is a small model, but not a trivial model. Most people would get this model wrong, actually. And it's instantiated just by instantiating these three blocks, these three clusters of concepts, these uh, three design patterns. Fourth point, because now this language has this ontological semantics that we can leverage on, we can deal, uh, address one of the most uh, pressing issues in conceptual modeling these days, right? We have models. So my group, for example, has a, a, a project with the European Space Agency, and they have a model with more than 15,000 classes, right? The, the question is, how do you deal with these models? How do you break down these models in cognitively tractable chunks, in modules, extract viewpoints and do summarization or abstractions of the model such that you can understand the, from a bird, uh, bird's eyes view what that model is about. So we work on different strategies. If, if you have to do this in, in, in an ontologically neutral language like ER or UML, it's extremely hard because you just don't have the information, right? All classes and relations are the same. So the only thing you can rely on is on the topological properties of the graph, which is a very crude method because, uh, you know, if you use, for example, um, um, page rank, people have used page rank to define, take the classes in which more links are getting to that class, right? It has more input links. 
this is a crude way because you imagine if you have address, everything has an address, everything will point there, but it's not an interesting class. While well, person and organization are on the top of your model, not super connected to everything, but they are essential because they are given the identity of everything in your model. So what we do here is we use different techniques. I'm just showing very briefly one in which you go to this relational context and we try to break down the model in the let's say the a kind of closure of this relational context. Just intuitively, if, if you look at someone like me, you know, I have several contexts in my life at the University of Twente, at the University of Bolzano, and, and um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a father and I'm an Italian citizen and Brazilian citizen and so on. So for example, all my um, mandates as course director and supervisor in the University of Twente, for example, uh, PhD supervisor, they will be um, dependent on my employment at the University of Twente, but completely unrelated to my personal life as, as a father, for example, or my citizenship and so on. So what we do is we look at this relational context and we try to extract a, a chunk of the model that is um, self-sufficient. It can be understood in a self-sufficient way. We basically go from the relator, this relational context, to the roles which are played in that context. And we, until we find identity, the identity, the kinds that provide identity for all those things playing those roles. So the marriage, the employment, the car ownership, and this is a bit more less obvious, but it's the correct one, which is the car rental, everything for you to understand what a car rental is about. So we can automatically break down this model in this packages, the car rental, the employment, the car ownership, and the marriage in, a, in an automatic way, in a deterministic way, in a computationally efficient way. We do abstraction as well, which is problem of, you know, take a model with 500 classes, give me a model with 20 classes that really captures the gist of what that model is about. And that's what we do here, again, in a deterministic computationally efficient and uh, automatic way, we can produce that by um, looking at the kinds in the model, which are those things that tessellate your universe, right? And try to project all properties into those kinds. Another thing we can do is the following. We separate the, the problem of conceptual modeling, of really capturing the domain semantics and in a way that helps humans in tasks like problem solving, domain understanding, communication, from the multiple computational problems that we can solve with codifications of this model. So from one, uh, so the, the problem of conceptual modeling is a problem that is essentially about ontology in the capital O sense. So I, this is the second uh, takeaway message. No ontology without that phase, no ontology without ontology in the capital O. Once we have that, we can, create several mappings from this uh, conceptual models, from these ontologically well-grounded conceptual models to different implementations. So from onto UML, we have created mappings, automatic mappings from to relational database, for example, and there are some interesting properties. So we, instead of having one table per, per type or one table, one table per class or one, one table per hierarchy or one table per, per leaf node, we have one table per kind. And there are some interesting computational properties that you get from that. We have, you know, we generate code in different languages and we generate specific, logical specifications in languages like OWL, for example. And this is, can be done automatically. So once you have this uh, model, which is now correct by design, you can choose what kind of mapping what you want to do. And then you do this mapping, you generate automatically our code. There are many ways of doing that because of the difference in expressivity of the two languages. I can talk about it if people are interested. But once you generate code in OWL, then you can use any tool you want, right? Protege, for example, for doing reasoning uh, and so on. Here is the sixth thing, and this is an important one. Um, our uh, tool like Protege, for example, helps you with verification, with checking if the model is, uh, you know, satisfiable, if it is consistent, and so on. This is important, but this is just half of the story, right? We need to support if you want to use these models as pivot models for semantic interoperability. We need to support validation, right? And these semantic domain models are not just doodling expressions; they are contracts. They are 
contracts telling the world what is the ontological commitment in that representation? What is the worldview embedded there? So just as a fresh reminder, verification is, did we build the right model? Is the model consistent, logically consistent, satisfiable, and so on? Or validation is, did we get the model right? Did, did we get, build the right model? So the first one, did we build the, the model right? Second one, did we build the right model? Is the model we built the one we should have built, the one that really represents my shared conceptualization of the domain? And we address this problem in the following way by looking at the distinction between the possible interpretations of the model, if we look at the logical specification, so the possible models of the logical specification, and the intended interpretations of the model. The intended interpretations of the model is in someone's head, right? So how do I know if the model is saying what it should be saying on my behalf, right? Um, frequently, we leave uh, constraints out of these models, and these models become under constrained, for example. So they accept as valid instances, valid interpretations, valid populations, things which are not intended. Or sometimes they are over constrained. So they exclude, they, they have too many axioms and they exclude from the possible interpretations um, intended ones. So what we, the problem of conceptual modeling and ontology specification is the problem of finding the right set of constraints that will make these two sets identical, right? So what do we do? Um, so finding out the constraints that I should put in this model is the, this real problem. Part of this problem is solved by ONTUML already, because remember, these patterns are um, micro theories. They are representations of micro theories. So every time I use this pattern, I'm including already a number of axioms there, right? However, there are a bunch of domain constraints which are in the mind of the user, right? Like, for example, the constraint that I should not be my own supervisor in the PhD program in France. I cannot enroll and declare myself as my own supervisor, right? This, this can happen, but this can't happen because of a domain rule. So a domain-dependent system cannot know about domain-dependent rules. So the question is, how do we find out about these domain-dependent rules? So what we do is to use, we, we have a mapping from, from ONTUML to Alloy, the, the, the specification language Alloy, building some sort of model structure on Alloy. So it, this gives us some sort of execution semantics to this. Uh, so we, this structure, this infrastructure show us, shows us the possible interpretations of this model. So if we look at this model, it will show us that, you know, the same organization can play the role of supplier and customer and corporate customer in different contracts. But as we iterate through the possibility, this will pop up as well. So it's the organization playing the roles of customer and supplier in the same contract, right? So selling to itself, which is undesired, unintended. So in fact, we can even identify that it's this part, this fragment of this model that is causing the problem. The fact here that both um, supplier and corporate customers take their identity from the same kind of organization, and therefore they could be the same individual, right? So this is the a kind of fragment that when present in models will create the dissociation between possible and intended interpretations. It's called, uh, this is an anti-pattern, so a pattern that creates this kind of dissociation. Every time you have this relational condition, number of roles, and two of them take their identity from the same kind, of course, they can be uh, the, the, same, uh, the same at the instance level. Here's another example of an anti-pattern. So suppose I have two types and they have a relation and eventually these types are specialized and I have a relation between the two specializations. Frequently, there is an inclusion constraint between the two relations that people forget about. So for example, my heart is composed of ventricles, but in order for my heart to play uh, the role of a blood pump, the ventricle has to play the role of a pump. If we simulate, if we generate these instances for the model on the right, um, this is gonna pop up. So my heart is composed of ventricle one, Professor Axit's uh, heart is composed of ventricle zero, but when my heart pumps blood, it pumps blood with his ventricle and vice versa, which will be a very weird situation. So we identified a catalog of anti-patterns and we built a tool that detects and automatically uh, suggests rectification solutions for eliminating these anti-patterns. I don't have the time to go through this, um, but it's just some of the results. We took one of these models, which was professionally built by 
a governmental uh, organization, a whole team of 12 people across two years, and we gave them the tool to see how often we would find these anti-patterns in that model with 5,000, uh, 4,000 uh, concepts, and uh, how often they were errors, and how often they, they would accept our solution. So just to give you an example for this relation specialization, we found 315 instances of that anti-pattern in one single model. Each one of this is the model saying something on their behalf that they didn't know about. 88% um, of these were errors, and we managed to correct that automatically in 97% of the cases. And these are the results for the other anti-patterns. Again, we have 46 anti-patterns. I won't have time to go through this. I'm almost done. This is my last point. Um, what we did recently is we realized that people simulating these models, generating this instance and saying, I want this, I don't want this, this is intended, and, and uh, this is non-intended, not intended. Uh, this, were, this is very um, important information. People were basically curating for us a database of examples and counterexamples. So what we did was um, we, we ask ourselves this question, can we learn from this database of examples and counterexamples? And then we look into uh, this area of inductive logic programming is a forgotten uh, branch of machine learning in which we, um, having a background theory, which is the model itself, and it's examples and counterexamples, we can uh, infer or learn what kind of constraints are missing in the model that should be included in the model to make the set, to approximate those two sets of valid and intended interpretations. Just to give you a very brief idea, suppose I have this very simple model, it's not even known to UML, it's UML. So person, man, and woman, and these are this is the axiomatization, right? Every woman is a person, every man is a person. I run the simulation, someone looks at this and says, you know, in my jurisdiction, I cannot have someone who's neither, right? Which would be, um, the case um, H here, or I cannot have someone who's both, which again, the case H. So the person marks all these cases which are unintended, someone being both a man or a woman or, or someone being neither and so on. So what the, the tool will do is to detect the, what are the missing constraints? Basically the two anti-patterns. We are working on anti-pattern detection now, which is detect that whenever you have an instance which an instance of neither or an instance of both, these are unintended. And then you learn exactly what kind of constraints you should include there to exclude these things. Now, just to conclude my takeaway message. One, semantic interoperability is our biggest challenge but also our biggest opportunities. In order to address this, we need to, it's about semantic domain modeling. And semantic domain modeling is about specifying ontological commitments, right? It's getting the, the real world semantics, right? Which means that you have to treat these models as meaning contracts. Ontology is absolutely inevitable. And now I mean ontology with the capital O, so we should do it uh, properly. Um, ontology driven conceptual models. So, if you have language that is based on ontology with a capital O, these languages are pattern based, so we should leverage on that. Validation is key, in a sense, more important than verification. And validation provides a kind of executable, executable semantics to these models, which is very important. And finally, we should combine theory driven with, uh, with a data driven approach. So, come up with a theory, learn from the simulation results, and try to. Uh, support the automatic evolution of, of the models. That's it uh, for today. I'm sorry for uh, going you know, over the time, but I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm not complaining about it. Actually, uh, you could go all night through or till morning, uh, so I wouldn't mind. Uh, so uh, thank you again. Uh, so maybe there are some questions, uh, of course, uh, I'm I'm very curious on certain things. So, uh, but let me first uh, see if there are questions from the public. Uh, While people think about questions, let me say that I'm happy to share the slides, and I'll include some reference to you know general overviews of the approach and the tools I'm using here. They're all uh, available and open source, and so on. I can I'll include some reference to the tools as well. Sure, uh, and actually uh, uh, we have recorded this talk and uh, like other talks, we will make them available on the uh, YouTube so many people can benefit on it. So okay. if there are not urgent questions, I have some uh, things maybe I ask your opinion. 
So uh, I try to actually uh, build a meta model of you here and try to understand actually the, the, the thinking pattern that you have exercised to come to these conclusions. Mm -hmm. So what I see is that you have started with the uh, uh, vocabulary, which we could call the meta model or a grammar. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the base, you know, you had this ontology UML or whatever it is called. Mm -hmm. And then you initialize it with examples uh, so that uh, we start to have some semantics on them. Uh, so that we understand better uh, what actually semantic is. So you had these persons and so on. And clearly you have shown that actually different instantiations occur. And the question is how they work together. And then uh, uh, very interestingly, actually what you say is that uh, nothing is random, but uh, I don't know where it comes. So we can have a philosophical discussion, but they are building patterns uh, uh, and they are becoming more visible once you put some semantics or instantiation of these uh, grammars, let's say this uh, ontology. Mm -hmm. And you have found that actually they follow certain pattern, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, we can say that actually uh, the, there is maybe then a, a meta, meta grammar, uh, which you have actually classified them in your tool and you can select them since they define some pattern, they can be seen as a, a meta meta grammar. Mm -hmm. uh, these patterns are actually meta meta grammars and they become meaningful once you put them examples. So in other words, exam examples uh, show us uh, which meta meta grammar uh, it belongs to, to some degree. Mm -hmm. Correct me if, if I'm saying something completely stupid, but then what you have done is you have uh, given some domain information. So uh, you put some domain information, especially, especially to cluster. Mm -hmm. When I look at your clusters, actually there you put some domain semantics. Once you put mm -hmm. domain semantics, then we have uh, multiple uh, uh, perspectives on the same model, mm -hmm. depending on which domain uh, or which stakeholder or viewpoint you may have. Mm -hmm. So I see you have uh, meta models instantiated and uh, nothing is random, but there are some meta meta grammars. So I have questions, of course, where this uh, domain uh, uh, clustering comes. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, a, a projection maybe? Uh, okay, this is not very clear to me. And then uh, once you have that, then of course, uh, the question is uh, some rules. Uh, there are even more constraints on that. I, mm -hmm. uh, you show some patterns, but I see two kinds of patterns. One is uh, more or less, uh, uh, I won't say soft, but they are more, you may call them ethical patterns. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are, uh, let's say agreements we have that, you know, unfortunately I cannot uh, be my own PhD supervisor. Yeah. It would be great if I was <laughs> my own PhD supervisor. It would but, make life easier, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are more or less soft uh, rules, ethical rules, you may call them. But you also refer to the physical rules somehow, physical yes. rules. And then uh, you can you say that uh, all right, uh, uh, you may uh, also gather information and uh, in infer rules somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, so about this man and woman issue, but I must say uh, several years ago, I registered for a conference and there was no choice like I'm a man and woman or woman. Uh, it was about uh, eight or nine points I could choose. So I was yes. shocked to see that uh, <laughs> uh, people are now perceiving not uh, uh, such an easy thing to choose. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, does it make sense what I said? Yes. Uh, although you said many things, so there are four different questions there I could identify. So they're all very interesting. So let, let me go for, uh, so maybe I start from the end. So um, regarding this uh, man and woman exam, of course, it's just an example, right? And uh, the, the point is the ontology cannot tell you what are the intended models, right? No language can. It's just give you a, a, a way to check if what the model is saying is what you want the model to say, 
right? And of course, okay, so there are that's... jurisdictions or legal systems in which this distinction would be disjoint and complete, right? I'm, I'm definitely not defending that. But, um, I'm, and, and also it's a toy example. But um, the point is, when we create these conceptual models, we are trying to do something very difficult. We are trying to create something at the type level to regulate the possible populations at the token level, right? So the only exactly. way we can do that uh, is by including the right set of constraints. But it's very hard for the human mind to uh, understand what the model, what are these possible populations, to think about these possible worlds in a model sense, right? So uh, I, I don't believe we are able to do that without the proper support. So. I, I think I, I approach one of the, your first questions, which is where do these patterns come from? The anti-patterns, uh, the mistakes we do come from flaws in our cognition, our inability to see those mistakes. I mean, we can see that in discourse as well. So we have fallacies like, you know, the composition and the decomposition fallacies. These are anti-patterns in reasoning, right? I think these are the anti the equivalent of fallacies in the modeling level, right? Uh, at the modeling level. Um, you were, so now the difference between domain patterns and, and domain, sorry, domain independent patterns and domain constraints. The, the domain constraints is, it's really, it's impossible for a, a system that it's domain independent to know about domain constraints. I mean, no system can know that um, I'm, I'm not supposed to be my own supervisor, right? And, and these are not, maybe the name anti-pattern in this case, hides um, something which, maybe there, there should be a distinction there between anti-patterns, which are never the case. Like for example, if my hand is part of me or my heart is part of me, I'm part of the universe of Twente, but my heart's not part of the universe of Twente. So it's a, it's a case in which transitivity fails of part of, right? And this is really an anti-pattern. If I, if I deduce that my heart is part of the universe of Twente, this would be a mistake. The examples we saw that you should not be your own supervisor or you, or you should not sell uh, to yourself, these are kind of cold smells at the conceptual modeling level, right? So these are model smells. That's why we don't know if they are wrong. They are just fishy. If we knew they were, they were wrong, we could include this as synthetical constraints in the language. It's exactly because we don't know that this approach of showing the user these possibilities uh, uh, is useful, is, is fruitful, right? But let me go back even further and try to make a very concrete example on the relation between ontology, language, constraints, and so on. Let's suppose I want to create a modeling language to model events, right? People are interested in events in business process modeling, in a, you know, complex event processing, in event detection, and so on. It seems um, quite uh, clear uh, that in order to do that, we have to understand what events are, right? So I have to first come up with a theory of events and how events are uh, different from objects. So questions, ontological questions would be, you know, can events have parts? Can events be extended in time? Um, can events have properties? Can the properties of events change? Are true events the same if they have the same uh, parts? Are true events the same if they occupy the same sp spatial temporal regions? What are the properties or the or relations that can be established between events, causality or temporal uh, precedence or uh, synchronization and so on. So we have to understand this, right? What, what are events? And then once I come up with a theory of events, if this is a formal theory, I can design a language to model events that would have those notions of complex and atomic events and all that, and would also have in, in its meta model these constraints that wouldn't allow me to have cause, you know, referential causality, an event causing itself or an event causing things in the past and so on, right? So I think this answer is one of the questions. So where do these patterns come from? Co come from the ontology sometimes, right? So the patterns mostly come from the ontology. Um, the anti-patterns mostly come from our flaws in cognition. However, um, so for every time I'm modeling an event, because events can only exist if in time, so they must have temporal properties in space, they must have participants. If it is a complex event, it must have at least two disjoint parts. 
every time I'm modeling a complex event, whatever it is, if it is this talk, if it is a football game, if it is a music concert, they will have the same characteristic and I will be able to reuse the same patterns, right? However, there are things which um, are fine for a football game, but not for a music concert. So these domain constraints, I can only find out in a posteriori, a posteriori, right? And that's why these simulation tools will help us to find that out. The last bit is, as you, we all simulate these models and we say, we want this and we don't want that because all the anti-patterns that we have now, we, have, we had to find them out by ourselves. So we did dozens of simulations and, we, and these structures started to emerge and we started using these structures and putting in the tool. But there are many other structures out there that we are unaware of. So by using this learning approach, we believe we can learn from the crowd. So we are crowdsourcing simulation and we are trying to use this approach to learn these patterns. So uh, exactly. So I think that, that, that hopefully, I hope uh, the, the, the computer science software engineering uh, becomes more and more ontological uh, because uh, we don't want to only hack software, but we want to create things consciously. So from that perspective, I you know uh, I completely agree. One, my, my last question is, we are running out of time, but it's such an interesting topic for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure for many people, uh, we are now in the age of, you know, uh, uh, digital twins. Uh, the distinction between reality and model is disappearing. Uh, so we have uh, so-called reality and model of reality, which is causally connected mm -hmm. and online. So uh, hopefully they are consistent. You may also build a digital model of a digital model, like a meta model, for example, we want to control it. And again, we have from reality, a symbolic representation and reasoning of reasoning, and we may even try to enforce our models on physical reality. So, uh, you know, this metaverse and all these discussions. So uh, we are, uh, after some point, we don't know if we are a, a model or reality or a model of a model, uh, especially if we have these brain interfaces and or the interfaces to our physical environment. So um, I think this this work then becomes even more interesting. Have you before closing? Do you have any remark on that? Okay, that's a very interesting uh, point. By the way, let me say very briefly that I remember when I was your student in the domain engineering course, you used to say that if you don't get the domain constraints right, no knowledge of Java can save you. And I keep repeating that for 20 years. Uh, it's, so you're exactly on the same page there. Uh, regarding digital twins, I, the digital twins are like models, right? So they're kind of conceptual models that have this very strong relation with their reference in a way that they reflect the changes which happen in the reference. Um, I think we will build matrices of, of digital twins capturing different perspectives, but this highlights, so if they are digital twins of something, we need to really understand the semantics of this something such that we can relate all these different twins, right? So it's, uh, I mean, your, your Real world semantics becomes even more important because the only way to relate all these different uh, perspectives or projections over the same uh, reality, the same mode of reality, is really understanding the phenomenon, the central phenomenon. The last point is, if we if if we find out that um, that phenomenon, that what we call phenomenon, is actually another model right? That we, this is the digital twin of something else. It doesn't matter. It just matters that we have a fixed point. And once we have that fix, fixed point and we treat in that context, that fixed point as, as reality, as the phenomenon, that the semantics of that thing will help us to unify all these different views. Okay. So that, that makes sense to me. Yes. Thank you very much again for your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, I think uh, hopefully hopefully we will uh, continue on uh, these discussions. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully, as I said, uh, uh, software engineering becomes, uh, will become more and more ontology engineering. Thank you once again.